Class number five, standing waves. Sounds like another one of those arid physics subjects, yet it will bring the understanding of one of the most wonderful things in life, music. Traveling waves happen in unbounded spaces. What if we create some waves, for instance in a string of finite length L, fixed at both ends? This happens. The number solutions f in x minus ct and g in x plus ct must be such that they add to zero at their boundaries. This results in a wave that does not travel, but stands there. It is a standing wave. But here's the amazing part. No matter what kind of disturbance upon the string, the motion will be periodic in T equal 2L on the C, where C is the propagation speed of the waves. The component traveling waves are also periodic in space the period in this case being lambda equal 2L. This lambda is a property of periodic waves called the wavelength. Doesn't that a periodic ring any bells? Yes, it does. A periodic wave can be thought as being the result of an infinite series of sine waves that share the same period. As you keep adding terms, the sum will converge to the original wave. Wonder why D'Alembert didn't use sines and cosines instead of his f's and g's in x plus minus ct, huh? Sebastian, poor old D'Alembert, has been dead for five years by the time Fourier came up with his genius approach in 1788. Tough times came after that, the reign of terror of the French Revolution. Fourier was in prison, but managed to survive. La was here, the father of modern chemistry. He was not that lucky, he was guillotined. This particular standing wave had been created by plucking the string at its center, forcing its components to be asymmetric to that point. That is why the Fourier series components with frequencies that are even multiples of the first are missing. Plucking the string at any other point but the center will generate components with even frequencies. But uh, approaching the problem with Fourier series analysis changing the wording to the description of this phenomenon. The system, a string with two fixed points, allow vibrating in a set of standing sine waves with frequencies that are integral multiples of C over 2L. These are called vibrational modes. In math language, the motion equation of Y for vibrational mode N may be expressed like this, where the angular frequency omega sub N is 2 pi by N times C over 2L. The initial conditions will determine the subset of vibrational modes that will be excited. Systems that sustain standing waves are complex oscillators with many vibrational modes. Each vibrational mode is like a simple oscillator having its own free-running oscillation frequency and attenuation coefficient. Also, under force oscillation, each vibrational mode shows its own resonance frequency, bandwidth, Q, and C that's of zero. Also characteristic of vibrational modes are the presence of nodal points, those in red that don't move. And the antinodes that are those that move the most, shown in green. Vibrational mode N 
has n antinodes and n plus 1 nodes. The vibrational modes in two-dimensional systems like the rectangular membrane fixed at its borders. Here's the 2D wave equation, and from the magic hat, the solution. Notice that it's pretty much like the 1D, only that it adds another sinusoidal factor for the Y. And here are some vibrational modes. It's also worth noticing that the natural frequency of its vibrational modes are no longer necessarily integral multiples of the fundamental. So no sound waves coming out of such a system are periodic. Standing waves in 2D also have antinodal points, but uh, nodal lines instead. Standing waves in 3D, say a room with smooth, rigid walls, also have antinodal points, but this time nodal surfaces. These are undesirable in theaters and recording studios. That's why smooth, rigid walls are avoided. Check out that wall. Unfortunately, there are not too many rectangular drums out there, so we must take a look at those circular membranes fixed at their boundaries. The wave equation in Cartesian coordinates would be of little help with a circular system, so we need to express the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates that are for 2D are also called polar. From the magic hat, here comes the solution. I'm afraid to ask, uh, but what's the J in there? Huh, <laughs> the J's are the dreaded Bessel functions. But don't worry, all the hard work has already been done. And that's because the solution to that problem explained not just the drums, the cymbals, or the gongs, but our eardrums. Here are a few vibrational modes, and by the way, the frequencies here are also not multiple of a fundamental, so no periodic sound waveform is heard. The following is what is important to learn. This mode, the one with the lower frequency, is the fundamental tone, and these are overtones. Same happens here. And the same here. But there's something special about these overtones. Unlike the membranes, all their frequencies are integral multiples of the fundamental. That is, they share the same period then they're not just overtones, but harmonics. Only standing waves composed by harmonics are really periodic. Pressure waves can travel along a pipe, the same as in a string, and uh, standing waves can be created inside a short pipe, same as in a string. A pipe has vibrational modes, same as a string, right? Exactly. Here are some modes for a pipe that is closed at both ends. And what's the big deal about overtones being multiples of a fundamental? Uh, that's a fair question. You see, some energy from these standing waves escape the boundaries as sound waves that can be heard. Our brain is especially good at processing patterns. Periodic waves have special patterns that go straight to emotions. As neuroscientist Seth Horowitz puts it, We are emotional creatures and emotions are evolutionary. Fast responses. Things you don't have to think about. 
sequences of those periodic waves are what we know as music. That's why those special overtones are called harmonics, because they become the basis of musical harmony, and those periodic waves are called notes or tones. Musical instruments can play a tune using either strings or pipes. Wow! What about drums or bells? No strings or pipes there. Those are instruments for the rhythm section, you idiot. You can play no tunes with them. Sebastian, stop it. That's not a stupid question. Maybe you can explain to him why is it that you cannot play tunes with drums or cymbals, huh? Uh, um, yeah, I thought so. Here's the story I once heard from my mother. She became celebrity in Cuba for being the Cuca Rivero of Cuca Rivero's choir that performed in the highest rated TV show of the 50s. But she's mostly remembered for being the invisible teacher that taught thousands of kids how to sing and enjoy music over the radio. My mother's hometown was one high. A place with lots of colorful characters that she enjoyed talking about. One of those was this inventor that came up with a novel musical instrument called the Piano Bombo. He managed to connect the keyboard with small hammers that will hit drums of different sizes. He tuned them so that the frequency of their fundamental vibration modes matched the notes. Besides smaller details such as that of being absurdly practical, no sequence of keystrokes sounded like a tune. That was because the overtones in membranes are not harmonics, and so its sounds could never be periodic. Besides, when a piano plays a chord, the harmonics of the lowest key matches the fundamental harmonics of the high ones, and that will never happen in a piano bumbo. What about the microphone? Yeah, true that you're not plucking strings or blowing into pipes here, and that the overtones generated by vibrational modes of the metal bars are not necessarily harmonic. However, see those tubes hanging below the metal bars? Those are resonators. Only those overtones that match the modes of the tubes, which are harmonic, will be heard. I'm glad you asked because your questions takes us to forced standing waves. While some musical instruments produce their sound by allowing free running oscillations, Others use resonance effect to allow only harmonic rubber tones. Like the vibraphone we already talked about. These use resonance as well. The violin bow when propped against the microphone produces noise, which has a frequency composition like this one. The frequency composition of a sound it's called its spectrum. Not that kind. Anyway, noise has a continuous spectrum, meaning that it has a frequency component on every frequency. 
However, the violin filters that sound and only the frequencies that match the resonance of the vibrational modes of the violin will be heard. The instruments in the entire wind section use resonance. There's nothing natural about having vibration and strings with loose ends, but physics teachers have found several ways of implementing them so they can show their vibrational modes. Strings are good for teaching because there the waves can be seen, while in pipes can only be heard. Yet, yeah, pipes with open ends, those are very natural. The flute is a pipe open at both ends. The pipe is shortened when the holes are opened by the keys, and this keys changes the vibrational modes. The one shown here is the modern concert flute but it's the oldest harmonic instrument. It has been around since the Stone Age. The organ pipes are also open at both ends. The keyboard selects which pipes to activate. Other wind instruments like the clarinet are open in only one end, allowing no even harmonics in its spectrum. What about the trumpet? The trumpet makes a very poor teaching example. It evolved from a signaling device to a musical instrument only after the 14th century. The trumpet should have been like a clarinet, but the bell raises the lower resonant frequencies like the third to the fourth, and the mouthpiece does the opposite to the high resonances. The result being that it approximates the full harmonic series. The skill of the player makes the final adjustment. There's still a very ancient instrument we have not talked about, his hand. Obviously, it's the human voice. Uh, by the way, is it a wind or a string instrument? I would say it's a string one, because harmonics are generated by the vocal cords and not by air column resonance. Just as the violin's body, the larynx mouth cavity enhances some harmonics while others are attenuated, and that changes the spectrum of the voice. Wonders of technology, video cameras have become so small 
that it might be possible to see the vocal cords in action. A few muscles make all the necessary changes in tension and proximity to produce the voice. Some amazing piece of engineering, right? It is the relative amplitude of the harmonics which call us the sound of an instrument and allow us identifying it. The color is also known as the timbre. It is the timbre what allows not just to identify which musical instrument is playing, but also that of recognizing someone's voice. Here's the sound of a flute and a saxophone. Can you tell which is which? A professional musician may have no trouble with this question, but it may not be easy for an untrained ear. That's what it was. What about now? Huh. I'm sure you had no difficulty in identifying the sax of the great Paquito de Rivera or the exquisite flute of Elizabeth Westland. It is not just the timbre that gives away the instrument that's playing. There are other clues, like the envelope. The attack, decay, sustain, and release. The envelope describes the way the amplitude varies in time, which is different in every instrument. There's no sustain, and there's no release. It's time to recapitulate. That's it? No math, just physics? What? Is that too good to be true? We have been using math concepts that are quite advanced and pretty abstract, yet music makes it all touchable. We'll be using true-false statements in the quiz to summarize class number five. Well, it's that time. Time for the quiz. The answers can be found after the end of the video. Say if it's true or false. Standing waves happen when they are generated within bounded spaces. Waves must be sinusoidal in order to have a wavelength. Only periodic waves have sinusoidal components. Vibrational modes of a system do not depend on the initial conditions. The sound out of a vibrating membrane has overtones, but not harmonics. Overtones out of vibrating strings are harmonics, but only when plugged in the middle. Each vibrational mode in a system stand for a possible sinusoidal standing wave. Wind instruments work by allowing free-running oscillations in air columns. The spectrum is the frequency composition of a waveform, no matter if it's periodic or not. Human voice spectrum is not due to vocal cord vibrational modes, but to the larynx mouth air column. Instruments that allow free-running oscillations like the guitar or the piano, do not have a sustained part in their envelopes of their notes. Problem number two, each vibrational mode is like a simple oscillator, so it has its own cue. Here's a reminder of all the things you are. Uh, wasn't that a song? When all the things you are Did you say cue? That was Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> A. Q is the quotient of the natural frequency over twice the attenuation coefficient. B. Q is also the quotient of the displacement of resonance over the static one. C. Q 
is 2 pi times the quotient of the energy of the oscillation over the loss in one cycle. Q is pi times the number of free running cycles in tau seconds. And finally, Q is the quotient of the natural frequency over the bandwidth. Using C, prove that if the attenuation force is linear with the velocity, the Q sub n of the vibrational modes in a string are proportional to their frequencies. If the bandwidth be always the same. You're right. There's nothing new about this assumption. When dealing with oscillations, we always consider damping forces proportional to the velocity. Uh, let's go on with the quiz. Problem number three. An important implication of what you just proved is that under these assumptions, the timbre of the plug string in a guitar or piano would remain unchanged in time as is the case. Why? Hint of all the things Q are. Use D. The one that says that Q is by time the number of free running cycles in tau seconds. I know what you're thinking, don't say it. Okay. Problem number four. In real life, the overtones out of a plot string or any instrument based on free running oscillations decay faster, the higher its frequency. Actually, if oscillations are allowed until the sound dies, the last you hear is just a fundamental. What is this telling you? Problem number five. In a piano, the standing waves are excited by hammers hitting the strings. For this exercise, assume that the hammer hits at one fourth of the string length. Which harmonics would be the strongest and which the weakest? And finally, problem number six. Explain what's going on here. Wow. Standing waves brought up periodic waves, and those were turned straight into emotions by that pattern-sensitive brain of ours. The physics of sound had allowed us to start understanding that wonder, that mystery, music. But there's so much more to come. Why do we hear what's not there? What makes duets feel different than solos? Why do symphonic orchestra need more than 20 violins but only 3 basses? Subscribe to the channel. Only after you have answers of your own is that you can take a peek at mine. Here they are. True or false? Here we go. Standing waves happen when they're generated within bounded spaces. That is correct. Waves must be sinusoidal in order to have a wavelength. Not really. A wave must be periodic to have a wavelength, but not necessarily sinusoidal. <laughs> Only periodic waves have sinusoidal components. Well, if you add a pure tone of, say, 100 Hz to another of 100 Hz by the square root of 2, you get a non-periodic wave that has two sinusoidal components. Here's another argument. Waves produced when a membrane vibrates is composed by sinusoidal waves, yet it is not periodic. And another one, noise is certainly not periodic, but you can find it has sinusoidal components in every value of frequency. In other words, it has a continuous aspect. The vibrational modes of a system do not depend on the initial conditions. Hmm. In fact, the vibrational mode set is a property of the physical system with its boundary condition. For instance, an air column opened at both ends. Which vibrational modes will be excited? 
that will depend on the initial conditions. But those not excited still exist. So that is correct. The sound of a vibrating membrane has overtones, but not harmonics. The sequence of the frequencies of the vibrational modes of a rectangular membrane is given by this expression. So, most of the overtones are an irrational number of times that of the fundamental. However, in a string fixed at both ends, the overtone frequencies are integer multiples of the fundamental. That makes any standing wave perfectly periodic, and the overtones are then called harmonics. It is true. Overtones out of vibrating strings are harmonics only when plucked in the middle. Well, all vibrational modes of a string have frequencies that are integer multiples of a fundamental, so they are all harmonics. When plucked in the middle, only the odd harmonics are excited. When plucked elsewhere, then some of the even modes get excited as well, but those are also harmonics, so this is... Each vibrational mode in the system stands for a possible sinusoidal standing wave. Hmm, that's a nice way of putting it. Wind instruments work by allowing free running oscillations in air columns. Nah, wind instrument, at least those in the wind section of an orchestra, use forced oscillations, and it is the resonance effect that allows only harmonic overtones. So, <laughs> The spectrum is the frequency composition of a waveform, no matter if periodic or not. Every waveform has a spectrum. Periodic ones have spectra with evenly spaced spikes in frequency. It is true. Human voice spectrum is not due to vocal cords vibrational modes, but to the larynx mouth air column. In fact, the harmonic spectrum of the human voice is like that of vibrating strings, the vocal cords. The larynx mouth cavity has wider resonances that enhance some harmonics while damping others, giving each human a particular timbre that allows voice recognition. So, it's the opposite. Instruments that allow free-running oscillations, like the guitar or the piano, do not have a sustained part in the envelopes of their notes. Well, that's true. Free-running oscillations are always damp and die out exponentially. Therefore, they don't have a sustain. And since there's no sustain, there cannot be a release either. Using C, remember C, right? Prove that if the attenuation force is linear with velocity, the Q sub ends of the vibrational modes in the string are proportional to their frequencies. Okay, here's a strategy. We find the energy of oscillation of small string element dx. Then the energy loss in one cycle, both in terms of the frequency omega. Then we do the quotient, and if necessary, we integrate in x. Uh, sounds like a plan. Good. Let's do the energy of oscillation of a string element dx. It always equals the sum of the kinetic plus the elastic, but when y is zero, the velocity is the maximum and all the energy is kinetic. That is, one half of the product of its mass by the maximum velocity squared. There. But the velocity is the time derivative of y. We can use y as a solution to the wave equation of the string with fixed ends. That. That expression was the solution to the wave equations with no damping. Oh my god. But there's energy loss here. Hmm. That's a sharp observation, Sebastian. However, in all those things, QR, 
high values of it are always assumed, so the amplitude during a single cycle can be safely considered constant for this calculation. Satisfied? Good. Let's go on. Doing the time derivative, we get the expression for the velocity in x and t. But the maximum value happens when the cosine is plus or minus 1, leaving Bmax as a function of x only. Now we we'll replace Vmax in the expression for the kinetic energy of the element dx and we get good. The oscillation energy of element dx was found to be this. Now we need the energy loss of element dx, which is the work of the attenuating force F sub A during one cycle or the closed line integral of S sub A dy in math language. This F sub A must be assumed linear with the velocity, so the force on an element dx must be a product like k by v by dx, or k is a constant. Finally, putting the displacement dy in terms of x and t as uh, v and xt dt, we can express it as this. Now replacing the velocity by the time derivative of y, we'll get something we can integrate. Only with the function of t stays inside the integral. Changing the variable now to theta equal omega sub n by t, the integral turns to this. And that in the parenthesis equals pi. Look it up. Rearranging will get the expression for the losses in one cycle. Now we go back to all the things QR, and namely C. And uh, we put the energies with their expressions. There's a lot of canceling here. Good, the dependence on x is gone. No further integrals necessary. Finally, the square of omega sub n goes to and we get... Ta-da! <laughs> the q's are proportional to the frequency. What was requested has been proven. Ah, uh, this was a lot of math. What's the big deal about those cues being proportional to the frequency? This result will take us to very important discussions in the following problems. This gets interesting. Stay with me. Problem number three. An important implication of what you just proved is that under these assumptions, the timbre of a plucked string in a guitar or a piano would remain unchanged in time, as it the case. Why? There was a hint. Use D. Which was that Q was pi times the number of free running cycles in tau seconds. Why? Because it implies that all harmonics decay at the same rate, plus maintaining their amplitude proportion, and which determines the temper. For instance, say the Q of the fundamental is 10, then the second harmony must be 20, and the third, 30, and the fourth, 40, and so on. They all decay at the same rate, so the timbre is kept. Problem number four, however, in real life, Overtones out of a block string decay faster the higher its frequency. Actually, if oscillations are allowed until the sound dies, the last you hear is the pure fundamental.
What's this telling you? The answer is, it is clearly saying that the attenuation force increases faster with a velocity than linear. And that is why the overtones die off faster than the fundamental. When you calculate the force of the wind on an object, or the force of still air on a moving car, velocities go squared, not linear. So about the same must be happening to the moving strings in a guitar. Problem number five. Waves are excited on a piano string by a hammer hitting at one fourth of a length. Which harmonics are the stronger and which the weakest? Here's the answer. The strongest harmonics will be those with antinodes of one-fourth of its length, which are the second, the sixth, the tenth, and so on. Absent harmonics will be those having notes at one-fourth of its length, which are the fourth, the eighth, the twelfth, and so on. Other harmonics will be present too, but will not be the strongest. And finally, problem number six. That asks explaining what went on on that video clip. Some vibrational modes of the membrane were shown. The grains of sand were pushed away from the zones where the vibration excited by the bow were more intense and accumulated along the nodal lines. Remember the nodal lines? The difference is that the membrane is free at all its boundaries, except at the point where the fingers touch. This damps all vibrational modes except those that have nodal lines passing by that point. That's what was going on there. That's all, folks.